This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Saturday morning. Final, uh, final uh, run for it. I uh, hope you've had a great meeting so far. Um, it's been fun for us. Um, I want to, uh, this morning, uh, thank all the podiatrists who are participating and uh, who, have, uh, who, are, who are joined us here in our audience, and the CPMA, who, uh, for the first time, we, uh, we have, uh, we've have partnered with, and I think uh, this is just gonna, this is gonna grow. Uh, over, the, over the upcoming years. Uh, this partnership with CPMA is very important to us. Uh, we feel that, uh, that uh, what we're gonna talk about this morning, which is the CLI uh, portion of uh, PAD, is uh, it's multidisciplinary. That's just the only way it can be done. And I think that uh, over the course of the morning and, uh, and uh, early afternoon, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll, see, you, you'll, you'll see why. Uh, Courtney Flukes is standing in the back in the yellow shirt, everyone. <laughs> Big round of applause for uh, Keeping this thing <laughs> flying. Courtney, thank you so much. I, uh, <clears throat> please tell Christina, thank you on our behalf as well. Um, we have uh, uh, delighted this morning to, uh, to uh, welcome uh, Michael Conti uh, as our first speaker. Uh, he's the E.J. Wiley Professor of Surgery, uh, UCSF, and uh, always, uh, always uh, hits the mark, uh, so to speak. So he's gonna start us off this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, everybody, to our Limb Salvage Symposium. We're, uh, this is something that's really grown in, at this meeting over the last few years. We're really excited to uh, be here with the uh, sponsorship of the CPMA and with our colleagues from podiatry. And um, as Chris pointed out, what we'll be talking about a lot this morning really is the, the importance of the multidisciplinary care of the patient with the threatened limb. So I'm going to start out with a, a talk about a really important trial that I think many of you may know about, but those of you who don't, I hope to uh, make you aware about it and why it's important, and that's the BEST CLI trial. <clears throat> These are my disclosures. I'm actually one of the co-chairs of the executive committee for the trial. So you're all aware that we have a growing ar array of treatment options from the standpoint of revascularization for patients with advanced PAD. The picture on the right is from Dr. Laird's article a few years ago, and it probably could be updated in terms of the tools that we have uh, for percutaneous intervention to achieve revascularization of, of advanced limb ischemia. And of course, we have open bypass surgery, which remains an important tool in the armamentarium. And the question we're faced with on a pretty everyday basis for patients who may be candidates for either is which really is best, what, which to use when to optimize the care of the patient and to get the most effective <laughs> and safe result. But it's really no small task to try to think about how we can get to an evidence-based solution for critical limb ischemia. <clears throat> it's really a big challenge for our field, and it's certainly not one that any one trial is going to solve. We really need you know, a decade of dedicated efforts with randomized trials that are different from the regulatory trials that we're, we're most comfortable with. First of all, we have this growing population of patients who are at risk and we really need to be able to define for specific subgroups of patients what's the most effective care. We've done a relatively poor job at defining the types of measurements that need to be made that really uh, line up with quality of care and outcomes for these patients and also even the way we talk to each other about what's the stage of their disease, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It's very costly, so everybody wants us to come up with a bit more of a streamlined solution. It's multidisciplinary, so there is the issue of turf and conflicts of interest. We really don't have a lot of comparative effectiveness studies to guide us today. A lot of what we do is based on our own personal experience and anecdote and <clears throat> stuff we hear. The regulatory trials, as I mentioned, really are of very little use. They tend to focus on patients with the most ideal anatomy. And actually, at this moment in time, the number of devices approved for the treatment of CLI is zero. 
yet there's lots of money that's actually spent uh, on devices in this field. You, you probably or you should be aware that the only randomized trial we have in this field is a decade old. It's the Basel trial. It was conducted in the UK. Uh, and it randomized 452 patients across 27 hospitals to a surgery-first or angioplasty-first treatment for what they called severe limb ischemia. It's really important to understand that uh, at the time of this trial, what, what constituted equipoise is really hard to get your arms around, but it's certainly different than what we have today. And in fact, when they did an audit of who came into the trial, it was only about a third of all comers to those hospitals. In fact, they deemed a third of the patients unreconstructable, which seems like a very high number probably to us today. 70% of these patients had ankle pressures greater than 50. Only 40% were diabetics. So it's a bit of an unusual uh, uh, study, I think, in that respect. And their primary endpoint, which we'll talk about also, is amputation-free survival. So what the Basel trial showed was on the first look, within two years, there's really no difference in overall survival or amputation-free sur survival for patients who were randomized to an initial strategy of angioplasty versus initial strategy of bypass. But the curves crossed at two years, and the, the final conclusions really are summarized in this slide. First, it's important to note that despite the fact that we know patients with severe limb ischemia have a lot of comorbid disease, that about 70% of these patients live beyond two years. And for those patients who are likely to live more than two years, it appeared that bypass surgery was favored. For those who had more limited life expectancy, angioplasty was favored. And we found out yet again, which was no surprise, that prosthetic bypass, which was part of what was in the bypass arm, performs really poorly for advanced limb ischemia. What are the limitations of basal? Well, there's quite a few. As I already mentioned, this cohort is very highly selected, and it's actually hard to really know who they are. Uh, when we look at a patient today, was that a basal patient? I'm not sure. So the generalizability of these results are really unclear. But really importantly, they limited the options for endovascular to angioplasty only, which is probably still the workhorse below the knee, but certainly is not reflective of total current practice. And the surgical arm mixed two things that are vastly different, vein bypass and prosthetic bypass. They also used, a, a, as a primary endpoint, amputation-free survival, which obviously is very important, but it is very limited as a direct measurement comparing revascularization strategies. And it wasn't designed to compare key subgroups, such as those with and without tissue loss uh, and those with different degrees of anatomic severity. So this really limits the way we use this in practice. I mean, we, we sort of have some very rough uh, ways of looking at this outcome. So with that, it took many years of, of work on the parts of the PIs of the best CLI trial, but they were ultimately able to get NIH funding for a large randomized prospective trial, which is the best endovascular versus best surgical therapy for a critical limb ischemia trial. And this trial began enrollment within the last few months. It will enroll 2,100 patients at 120 sites in North America. It's a four-year trial with each patient having a minimum of two years of follow-up, and it was a $25 million price tag uh, to fund this work. It's really important to note that the federal government thinks that the stuff that we, where we need evidence here is worth investing in, and so it's important for us to get behind this trial because if we don't, uh, if we don't satisfactorily enroll in this trial, we may not see that kind of investment in the future. The primary objective of the trial is to compare the treatment efficacy, the functional outcomes, and the cost in patients getting these two forms of revascularization. How are we going to do it in this trial? It's actually two parallel trials being done together. The first larger cohort are patients who are deemed to be candidates for a saphenous vein bypass based on preoperative vein mapping. So these are patients who you expect to do a single segment saphenous vein bypass. They have that anatomy available. And there will be 1,600 patients in that arm randomized to open surgery versus endovascular. And the hypothesis in that arm will be that bypass is better. At cohort number two, there are patients who lack adequate vein for a single segment bypass based on vein mapping. So they may need an alternative vein or a prosthetic or whatever it is that you want to use. Actually, all conduits are open in the trial. And the hypothesis there is that endovascular treatment will actually be better. That's a smaller cohort of about 500 patients. These studies will go on in parallel. The definition is a, is a pragmatic trial. So the definition of what constitutes the best form of revascularization is left to the investigator. 
So this is both a good thing and in a way it's, it's, a, it's, it's an issue for the trial because it's gonna be very heterogeneous. But all endovascular therapies are allowable that are approved with the exception of cryoplasty. As I mentioned, all conduits are allowed, including cryopreserve vein and prosthetic. And as new and evolving therapies coming out, such as DCBs, there is a committee that looks at technologies that will determine if they're suitable for inclusion as the trial goes on to keep the trial current and to allow the use of available tools to the vascular specialist. So as I mentioned, this stratification in this trial is very important because it means that, that it will not be random uh, how patients uh, break up into the two arms. So they will be balanced in terms of the clinical presentation, that is rest pain versus tissue loss, and it'll be balanced in terms of arterial anatomy, which is based on the presence or absence of below the knee, significant below the knee disease. So one stratification is, is disease limited to the above knee segment, and the other is the presence of significant infrapopliteal disease, which we know uh, is an important uh, factor, particularly for endovascular treatment. So just a word about endpoint, and it's, I just want everybody to understand uh, why uh, amputation-free survival is not the greatest endpoint to compare revascularization therapies. This is a curve of limb salvage, which uh, is from a trial that actually looked at patients who were supposedly had no option for revascularization, end stage of the end stage. Nothing to do, they had minor tissue loss, they had rest pain. These no option patients had a limb salvage rate of 87% at one year. These, these were patients who were randomized to a medical therapy of prostacyclin, or prostaglandin, and which had no effect. So these patients basically got palliation. And you can see that if you, if you pick certain patients right, even though they have critical ischemia, they don't get amputation at a very high rate. Now, this would not include patients with more severe tissue loss, but the bottom line is that limb salvage or its association with survival is a really insensitive way to measure the quality of revascularization <clears throat> because it doesn't account for multiple reinterventions. It doesn't account for uh, wound healing and pain and other issues that go on with these patients. <clears throat> so in this trial, the primary endpoint that was selected based on SVS performance goal definitions is major adverse limb event, free survival, which includes freedom from death, amputation, but also a major reintervention. So if a patient needs a new bypass graft, a new major revision of their bypass graft, or they need thrombolysis or thrombectomy, that's a major event in the primary endpoint. So we'll be comparing these two strategies based primarily on this endpoint. But of course, key secondary endpoints will include amputation-free survival, freedom from reintervention and amputation, which includes even minor reinterventions like a repeat endovascular procedure or a patch angioplasty to a graft, and uh, the inclusion of a male with post-operative death within 30 days. Other secondary, er, secondary endpoints of importance include freedom from clinical therapy. This means freedom from recurrence of the CLI syndrome, uh, freedom from critical limb ischemia, and freedom from hemodynamic failure, which includes <clears throat> non-invasive measurements that are consistent with anatomic failure of the reconstruction, even if the patient has not had a repeat procedure, because we believe that that's really the primary goal of revascularization, is to maintain hemodynamic success. Importantly, in this trial, there will be a lot of effort made to capture functional endpoints as well as cost. Several tools are being used for quality of life, including the VASQ-QUAL, which is CLI-specific, the UROQUAL, which allows for um, an allocation and, and also a way to, uh, to do qualies, and a six-minute walk test in a subset of sites, not for the patients with tissue loss, but for those with rest pain. <coughs> Treatment-associated costs, both in and outpatient, will be captured. There is a core at Harvard that's going to be doing the cost effectiveness analysis, and they will look at incremental cost effectiveness measured in dollars per quality. Importantly, in order for this trial to really have uh, to, be, to be important in the, in the treatment, it has to be inclusive of everyone who treats critical limb ischemia, so it, it includes uh, um, at every level, in every committee, and, and at all the investigators, vascular surgeons, interventional cardiologists, interventional radiologists, and vascular medicine specialists. If it's going to define practice, it really has to have everyone involved. So you can see there's balanced leadership. Uh, the PIs are, are Alec Farber, Matt Menard, and Kenny Rosenfeld, vascular surgeon and interventional cardiologist. 
and we have an executive committee that has representation from all of the specialties. Another important element of this trial is the, is the development of what's being called a CLI team at each site. So at each site, all of the participants who actively treat critical limb ischemia uh, will be investigators and are being asked to develop a team approach where they discuss the selection of appropriate candidates. So uh, all patients within the, within the confines of the trial and any of its registries will be on the CLI team. And the goal, of course, is to maximize collaboration to ensure that there's successful conduct of the trial, but also to ensure that everyone's invested in its outcome. It's important to note that two investigators at each site will need to agree that the patient is a candidate for the trial, and two investigators at each site will have to agree that there's a need for a repeat procedure, since repeat procedures are a key endpoint in the trial. This is the current summary of the sites across North America. You can see all across the U.S. and Canada, there are sites, including several in California. Currently, there are 92 sites activated of the 112 that were selected, and you can see that it does include a majority of vascular surgeons, but quite a few uh, non-vascular surgeons, including 130 interventional cardiologists, nearly 100 radiologists, and some vascular medicine specialists. So there are some key differences in terms of BEST and BASIL that are important. BEST is a larger trial. As I mentioned, it's meaning, meaningfully stratified by clinical and anatomic severity, which is how we think when we approach patients. There are two separate arms allow us to compare the outcomes in very different cohorts. Whether or not you have a vein is a big determinant of the outcome of bypass surgery. All treatment options are available. This better reflects real-world practice, and the primary endpoint, I think, of male-free survival is actually much more directly related to the treatment approach. But there are compromises in this trial that we recognize. Certainly, as I said, the fact that you can do anything means it's going to be kind of hard to figure out what did and didn't work, particularly in the endo arm where so many different tools can be used. This is a trade-off in a pragmatic design. So endo, as we know, is really not a defined specific treatment. It's a whole range of things. And you could even argue, is this, as we go on, is it kind of silly to call it one approach? Hybrid approaches are also excluded, such as a combined common femoral end arterectomy, uh, with a distal uh, endovascular treatment. Uh, patients need to have adequate inflow, so no inflow disease uh, can be present at the time. The stratification ensures there will be balance between those arms, but they're not separately powered, so you won't be able to have a high degree of testability within each of those strata about which is better. And, you know, there was a lot of guesswork still around these outcomes because we don't really know from the patients which of these outcomes they feel is most important. That's something else where we need to develop in, as, we, as we get to evidence in this field. However, it's a big opportunity, I think, for all of us to bring this to a higher level, to increase the level of engagement, not only within our own community, but also with the payers, with the government, with the, uh, with the NIH. Uh, it's a large representative trial. It's going to really show us what's happening in the real world practice. It's multidisciplinary. Uh, and it has all the appropriate ways of measuring outcome that are going to at least give us an idea of what's happening in, in the real world today. It's important to note that uh, on the other side of the so-called pond, the UK has also seen the importance of reinvesting in more research in this area, and BASIL-2 has also been launched. BASIL-2 is focused on below-the-knee disease, where they're going to compare uh, angioplasty and stenting to bypass surgery in, in below-the-knee disease. This will be a 600-patient trial randomized to either vein graft or best endovascular treatment. Uh, so it's going to largely parallel uh, this trial, and I think, you know, within a few years, these two trials are going to add a whole new basis of evidence to what we do. So in conclusion, high-quality randomized trials are sorely needed in the treatment of advanced limb ischemia. The best CLI is a landmark trial. It's going to address many of the limitations of basal, and it should be supported. We recognize that no single trial can address all of the evidence gaps we have, but this will need to be followed by future studies. And the outcomes in terms of cost and quality of life, I think, are going to be carefully scrutinized by the government and the payers. So um, I'll take a minute to take any questions, if there are, about the trial before we move into our debate. So, Mike, obviously the question about patency uh, has to come up. Um, we, we're not going to really have that. We don't have a, a core laboratory. How do we put this in context with all the other uh, CLI trials without something like that? <clears throat> right. You'll note that I didn't mention patency is not an endpoint of the trial um, because it's, it's, it's important, of course, to how we look at how our things are performing, but it's really a secondary endpoint for the patient. 
Uh, among the compromises in the trial, there's no core lab to look specifically at the, at the anatomic outcomes of the treatment. Um, there is an expectation in the trial that patients will get followed with non-invasive testing. There's a protocol about that, but there's no review of those core labs. And of course, those results of the surveillance will ultimately determine whether or not people get a reintervention, which is actually an endpoint. So it would have been nice to have a core lab to review all of that, but among you know, the various compromises with the cost of the trial, there is no core lab for imaging at the moment. John. What about, uh, <clears throat> yes. I didn't mention all of it. That's being tracked. But it's not being tracked with a core lab. It's being tracked at the site. Um, the CRFs are very specific about the wounds and, and where they are at each, at each visit, but there's no photographic capture and core lab of that. 